nanti nggak ketemu satu Nanti kan ada anak-anak pamuka ya ada apa? Eh, gitu. Oh, suaranya masih di sini, Boy. Tapi tapi tapi
and then they'd be like, Good morning. Hello, good morning. Hello, Sir Tujie. How are you? Hello, I'm fine. I hope everyone is fine as well. Okay, thank you. You too. How about the student from Team Su? Yes, I'm uh, uh, sending already... them the meeting link. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry for this inconvenience. <laughs> we have to change the link meeting. Yeah, that's okay. I think uh, Mom Devi has already joined in this meeting as well, but uh, we are we have a little bit a channel. What's that? The YouTube streaming. We have some uh, constraint on it, so uh, one of my students still struggling to connect into YouTube. But we have to uh, stop in a few minutes later. Hello, Mom Dewi. Good morning. Agni, good morning. Yeah, Miss, uh, Mr. Sertije has already come in. <laughs> Hi. Good morning, Sertije. Hello, good morning, Professor Dewi. <laughs> there, uh, our students are also connected now. All right. You can see them. <clears throat> okay. I think we could start uh, now. Mom Dewi. Check, check, check. All right. We start now. All right. Okay. All right. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining our <clears throat> lecture series program. And now we are in the season six. Is it, Ma'am Agnita? Uh, for Aldo, please, you, maybe you can mute your speaker. Aldo Febriansha. Okay, thank you so much, Aldo. Uh, this is, we are in season six. Is it true? Ma'am Agni. All right, ma'am. All right, ma'am okay. Dewi. We are in this okay. uh, session six. And... Session in session six. Okay, thank yeah. you so much. So session everyone, six, yes. 
I am Dewi. I am one of the lecturer in mathematics education program in Universitas PGRI Semarang, Indonesia. And about uh, one hour, I will moderate this session. So this morning, especially in this session, we will have Mr. Chart Estrada as our speaker, or usually I call him Sir TJ. Hello, good morning, Sir TJ. How are you today, Sir TJ? Hello, good morning, Mom Dewi. I'm fine, and I hope everyone there is fine, doing fine as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really nice to see you again. Uh, so, Sir TJ, uh, this morning we'll deliver a material about Ramsey theory. <clears throat> But before we go to uh, his presentation this morning, just let me introduce Sir TJ a little bit deeper, maybe. So Sir TJ has a full name chart Jan B. Estrada, and now he's a program chair of Bachelor of Science, Master of Arts, and PhD in Mathematics in Dimsu. And then uh, for the educational attainment, he graduated in 2006, a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics of University of the Philippines, Baguio. And then in 2009, he graduated uh, in Master of Arts Mathematics Education and Master of Science in Mathematics. Uh, Dimsu SLUC and University of uh, the Philippines Baguio and then in 2000 in 2018 he graduated uh, Doctor of Philosophy or PhD in Mathematics De La Salle University Manila <clears throat> And then for this last five years, he has been teaching advanced calculus, linear algebra, real analysis, numerical analysis, mathematical analysis, advanced uh, uh, number theory, graph theory, etc. And then Sir TJ also involved in many seminar and training as a participant, presenter, lecturer, uh, and speaker. And then involved in many professional organizations, such uh, Philippine Statistical Association, and then Philippine Association for Teacher Education, and etc. And then in August uh, 2019 and June 2022, he received an award as the paper presenter, as the best pre paper presenter and conference paper at once. Oh my God, I really... <laughs> Impressed. Uh, he also achieved the best thes uh, thesis, advisor, academic excellence award, and many more. So impressive. So I think that's all that I can tell about Sir TJ because it will take ages to finish in mentioning all the details about his profile. <laughs> all right, then, uh, everyone, it's time to uh, hit. Uh, Sir TJ's presentation for all the participants. Please mute the speaker, but make sure your video on. And for Sir TJ, please for five uh, for forty five minutes ahead time is yours. Hey, thank you so much, uh, Mom Dewi, for the kind introduction. Okay, so uh, good morning to everyone. So first and foremost, I would like to thank the Universitas PGRI Semarang for this collaboration with uh, Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University in uh, hosting this uh, international lecture series in mathematics and mathematics education. So uh, this is a, a good opportunity for our both our students, me for our students, in order for them to have an advancement. So, can I share my screen?
Okay. Hello again. Uh, did I get disconnected? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay, again, okay, and, uh, good morning to everyone. Thank you, Professor Dewey, for the kind introduction. Okay, so thank you uh, to the um, Universitas Pijer I. Simerang for collaborating and hosting this uh, international lecture series in mathematics and mathematics education. So this is a good opportunity for mainly our students uh, in mathematics and mathematics education for, in order for them to improve their knowledge or have advanced knowledge either in pure mathematics or in mathematics education. So uh, please allow me to share my screen. Okay, so can you see the title slide? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you so much. So uh, this short lecture will be about uh, Ramsey theory. So uh, actually, Ramsey theory is a subtopic. It's a, a subtopic in uh, graph coloring. So uh, if you have uh, experience in graph theory, one of the topics that are discussed there is about graph coloring. And uh, further into graph coloring, there is a subtopic called uh, Ramsey theory. So uh, in this uh, short lecture, what I will be talking about is uh, an introduction to Ramsey theory. So what are the main concepts, the key concepts that, uh, that are needed in order for one to understand uh, Ramsey theory? What are the properties of some Ramsey numbers? And uh, I will give a some related uh, problem to Ramsey theory. Okay. So since this is a topic about graph theory, so we will be needing uh, the following concepts. So mainly about a graph. So in graph theory, a graph G is a triple consisting of a vertex set, an edge set, and a relation that associates with each edge two vertices called endpoints. So here we have some examples of what we call as graphs in graph theory. So the, the elements of a graph are uh, the vertices. So the solid circles, Sometimes they are solid, sometimes they are hollow. We call them as uh, vertices or nodes. And then the, the lines that connect the vertices, we call them, call them as edges. So sometimes in a graph, the vertices are labeled, such as this one here. So the vertices are labeled U, U, V, W, X, and Y. Okay, same as this one here. So we call them as labeled graphs. So the vertices have a label. Sometimes we can also present graphs without any labels such as this one, uh, because uh, there are times when we are only interested in the structure of the graph and not the vertices. So sometimes there is no need for us to label the vertices. Now there are special kinds of graphs in graph theory. And in Ramsey theory, the particular kind of graph uh, that we need to understand is the complete graph. So what is a complete graph? So a complete graph with n vertices denoted by capital K sub n. This is a graph with, in which each vertex is adjacent to every other vertex. So this means that if you will draw some examples of complete graphs, uh, they would look like this. So here we have an example of a complete graph having four vertices, okay? So observe that all the vertices are connected. Each pair, each pair of vertices that you identify will be connected by an edge. Here we have K5, K6, K7, and so on and so forth. So these are some examples of complete graphs. 
And one interesting property of complete graphs is that uh, uh, we can find the number of edges. It's given by n times n minus 1 over 2. This is the total number of edges in a complete graph having n vertices. So in fact, this number is also the combination. It's the combination of uh, n objects taken two at a time. Okay, n objects taken two at a time. So that will give you n times n minus one all over. Ayan, ongoing pa siya. Some other, some other um, uh, definitions that might be useful. So we have a complement, a click, and an independent set. So what is a complement? So the complement, G, and then it has a, a bar on top of it. This is a simple of a simple graph G. This is a simple graph with vertex set V of G defined by UV in the edge set of G complement, if and only if UV is not in E of G. So this means that the complement of G is the graph where the uh, vert the edges between two uh, ed between two vertices is not present in the original one. Okay. So um, also we have a click, okay? A click in a graph is a set of pairwise adjacent vertices and, and an independent set in a graph is a set of pairwise non-adjacent vertices. So here is an example of a graph. Sometimes we call this as an acquaintance graph. So by acquaintance, we mean uh, friends, no? you, you know each other. So here we have five people. Okay, represented by the vertices U, V, W, X, and Y. Okay, and then the edges mean that uh, two persons are acquaintances of one another. Say, for example, U and Y here, they are acquaintances, so they know each other. X and W know each other. However, U and W, they do not know each other, so they are strangers. So this is an example of what we call as an acquaintance graph. So some elements in this acquaintance graph are the following. Uh, I ask here, are there people who are mutual acquaintances of one another? So when we say mutual acquaintances, uh, uh, each is an acquaintance or a friend of the other. So notice that if you, if you look at the vertices U, Y, and X, okay, forming a triangle, this means that one is an acquaintance of the other. This is an example of what we call as a click in graph. So a click is uh, it's like a, it's like a group of friends. Okay. So literally, that is what a click means in English. So when you say click, it's like a, a group of friends. No. So here, U, X, and Y is a click of order three. Okay, so here are some examples again of uh, uh, a set of a graph G and its complement. So this is the given uh, acquaintance graph. Its complement is the graph where the edges are those in which they are not present in the original graph. Okay, so this is the complement of the graph G. So in G complement, the role of a click is now reversed. So such a set of vertices is called an independent set. So here in the original graph, we have a click. Uh, we said that U, Y, X, this is a click. However, if you look at the complement of the graph G, U, Y, and X are no longer connected by edges. So they are no longer uh, they no longer form a click. However, we call them as an independent set, meaning U, Y, and X are now independent of one another. Okay, so those uh, concepts might be useful in a Ramsey theory. Since a Ramsey theory is a, a branch of graph coloring, as I have mentioned, so we also need the definition of a edge coloring. So a proper K edge coloring of a graph G is an assignment of K colors, one up to K, to the edges of G so that no two edges 
incident with a common vertex share the same color. So here is an example of uh, the Peterson graph. So the edges are now colored. This is an example of what we call as a proper edge coloring. So there's a word there, proper. It means that uh, when the edges are connected <laughs> to the vertex, okay, it means that they must be colored differently. For example, here, if you look at the edges connected with this vertex, one is colored uh, green, and then we have red, and then here we have uh, uh, cyan. Okay. So whenever they are connected by a vertex, they should be colored differently. So in graph coloring, we call this as a proper edge coloring. So the edges are colored. Here is another example. So here we have the Heywood graph, okay? And three colors were used to color the edges. So we have blue, red, and yellow, green. So notice that this is a proper edge coloring because whenever the edges have a common vertex, okay? Whenever the edges have a common vertex, the edges must be colored differently. So here we have red, yellow, green, and then blue. If they are not connected by a common vertex, then they can be colored with the same color. However, for Ramsey theory, uh, we will not need uh, proper edge colorings. Because in graph theory, when we, <coughs> when we hear the term coloring, what it conventionally means is that we are referring to a proper coloring. Okay, that is in general in graph theory. And also using, instead of using literal colors, one may also use numbers, usually positive integers or symbols to denote a color. Um, sometimes when there are too many colors, it's already hard to distinguish one from another. So usually uh, in graph theory, when, when we deal with coloring, we can also use numbers to denote, denote the colors. Okay, so it's not necessarily literally colors. In Ramsey theory, we are interested in edge colorings only. Okay, so that's when we say coloring or K coloring, we are referring to edge coloring. So for Ramsey theory, whenever we say coloring, we are actually referring to the coloring of the edges. Because in graph coloring, we can also color the vertices. But in the Ramsey theory, we, we are only concerned with the edges. Further, in Ramsey theory, we are interested in coloring of graphs that do not require adjacent edges to be assigned distinct colors. Such colorings are not proper edge colorings. So in Ramsey theory, uh, we will be dealing with what we call as monochromatic colorings. So this means that uh, um, in Ramsey theory, it is not needed that when two edges are connected by a vertex, that the colors will be different. In Ramsey theory, the colors can be the same, okay? So we can use the same color for edges having a common vertex. Uh, and usually in Ramsey theory, we make use of two colors, red or blue, that is the convention. Okay, so those are the uh, needed concepts. Now let us uh, develop uh, Ramsey's theorem, okay? So here is a, uh, uh, a real life problem, okay? So in any gathering of people, every two people are either acquaintances or strangers. What is the smallest positive integer n such that if there are n people in the gathering, there are either three mutual acquaintances or three mutual strangers. Okay, so when we attend, for example, a, a gathering or a party, for example, okay, it could be that not everyone know each other in the party. So the problem asks us, uh, how many people is the smallest number, okay? So that we can find three people who know each other, 
or three people who do not know each other. So what is the smallest number of persons in order for us to find okay, such um, acquaintances and non-acquaintances? So in fact, the answer to the situation above can be modeled by identifying what we call a red-blue coloring of a complete graph with n vertices, where each vertex represents a person. The red edges will indicate acquaintances, meaning they're friends, while blue edges will indicate non-acquaintance. And uh, we can argue that n must be greater than 5. Okay, So the number of people should be greater than 5. Because we can, in fact, identify a situation where there are n equals five people, and we can find no three vertices okay, having acquaintances or non-acquaintances. So here are an example. Here's an example. So the vertices, the vertices are uh, people, they are persons, and then the edges, this means that, uh, yes, yes, they will attend the party. The red ones indicate that, uh, they are, they are in acquaintance, okay? The, the, red, the red edges mean they are acquaintances, while the blue, blue edges mean they are non-acquaintances. So, here, in this example, we cannot find uh, three, okay, three persons that are acquaintances of one another or non-acquaintances of one another. The same with this example here. The problem is like finding a triangle, a triangle for which the edges have the same color. So in any of these, we cannot find any triangle why triangle? Because three, there are, uh, we require three persons. So we cannot find any triangle for which uh, the triangles are either colored red or blue. So we will just call them as monochromatic triangles. So it cannot be five. So maybe it's six, okay, the smallest number. In fact, it's six. Okay, and we will uh, show that later. So this is uh, Ramsey's theorem, okay? So formally, it's, uh, yes, it's uh, quite complicated, but we can simplify it in graph theory terms, okay? And we will dissect it. So Ramsey's theorem uh, in honor of Frank Plumpton Ramsey. So he says, for any k greater than or equal to two positive integers n sub one up to n sub k, there exists a positive integer n such that for any k edge coloring of the complete graph kn, there is a complete subgraph k sub ni for some i in 1 to k, such that every edge of k sub ni is colored in i. So uh, roughly speaking, what the theorem is telling us is that um, if you are given okay, a number of uh, integers, any number, so we can always find um, some complete graph, okay, a complete graph, a coloring of the complete graph, so that in that coloring, we can find a smaller complete graph that is colored either red okay, or blue. So that is the case where we are looking at two colors. only. So actually, that is what Ramsey theory is all about. Okay, two colors only. So here, for example, if we have two graphs, F and H, so the dotation is this one, the Ramsey number R of F, H. So F and H here are graphs. It is the minimum order or number of vertices of a complete graph such that for any red blue coloring of KN, we can find either a subgraph F colored in red or a subgraph H colored in blue. So, this number, okay, is the smallest number of uh, vertices for a complete graph, so that we can find uh, a subgraph F colored in red, for example, or a subgraph H that is colored in blue. 
So if we go back to the problem of finding the smallest number of persons, this problem here, so it's like asking the Ramsey number of two complete graphs of order three. Okay. So we are trying to find the Ramsey number of two complete graphs of order three. Okay. So previously we have posed the problem of finding the smallest complete graph for which any red blue coloring will allow us to find either a red triangle, this is a triangle, okay, or a blue. Triangle. So K3 is actually a triangle. So uh, we have already found no, that it should be greater than 14 because that is what we did a while back. So we can try six. Okay. So we can try six. So this is the complete graph of order six. Okay. So let's try if we can find Okay, a red or a blue uh, triangle. So let's consider some red blue coloring of the complete graph or of the six vertices. Observe that any vertex V in K6, there must be at least three adjacent edges of the same color. Okay, that is if you try all the possibilities. Okay, or simply by the pigeonhole principle. It's always like this, at least. Okay, so in K6, if you look at the vertices, the, at the edges rather, that are connected with a vertex V, so of course there are five edges, there are always three edges, okay, that are colored red. It can be blue, okay, but for, it does not matter if it's red or blue. We can just swap the roles of red or blue. For example, red. Okay, so at least three are colored red. It does not matter if this one is red or blue. These edges here. So what we do is we look at all the possibilities. So if we have red, uh, these uh, edges, then one possibility is that this one is red. This edge here is red or this edge here is red, or this one here is red. So in each of these possibilities, notice that we can form a red triangle. Okay, so there are always, there's always a red triangle here. And what is the other possibility? The other, the other possibility is if these edges are not red, okay, if, uh, none of them are red, then it means that they will be blue. Okay, so there. So if they will be blue, then we have found a blue triangle. Okay, so in that uh, argument, we can see that uh, whatever coloring that we do for the complete graph of order six, we can always find either a red triangle or a blue triangle. So therefore, six is indeed the answer to the problem. So if you translate that to uh, in, in the context of the problem, it means that uh, you need six people at least okay, in a party so that you can find three people who are either acquaintances of one another or three people who are non-acquaintances of one another. Random, okay? A random uh, set of six people. Okay? So that's actually the Ramsey number four. Uh, classical number, Ramsey theory. In classical number theory, uh, Ramsey theory, uh, we simply place the subscript here of K3. So we can also uh, denote this by R33. Okay? That is the uh, convention. However, in general, it's not always uh, complete graphs that uh, we are looking for when we deal with Ramsey theory. It can also be graphs, any graph in general. 
Say, for example, here, we have two graphs, F and H, okay? So F here is a, a graph with a triangle and um, uh, what do you call this? Uh, a, a vertex connected by an edge. H here is a triangle together with two vertices attached by an edge. So obviously, these are not complete graphs. However, Ramsey theory will also allow you to find the Ramsey number of these subgraphs. So what is RFH? So this is the problem of finding the smallest complete graph so that if you color it either with red or blue, you can always find a red F or a blue H or vice versa, a blue F or a red H. Okay, so consider the following red blue coloring of K6. So here, for example, if we look at K6, now let's try six. This example will tell us that six is wrong. Okay, six is not possible because in this red blue coloring, we cannot find a red F or a blue H. Okay, or a blue F or a blue H. Okay, because the red here are triangles, okay? Uh, notice that we require a triangle together with one more, one uh, vertex here. And for H, we require a triangle together with a uh, uh, one, two vertices paired by an edge. So we cannot find in this K6, in this red blue coloring. So the requirement is for any red blue coloring, we can always find. So actually, it's seven. Okay, K seven is the smallest complete uh, graph, which will give you RFH. Okay, so if you look at K seven, so we already know from the previous example that R the Ramsey number of K three K three is equal to six. However, what is K3? It's a triangle. It's a triangle. And this will always be present in K7. Okay? So it is assured that we can find a monochromatic, either a red or a blue, K3 in K7. So if we let U be the vertices of uh, this monochromatic K3, these are the things that can happen. So this is the blue K3 you know, that we have said, it always exists, okay? This is the blue uh, K3. So one possibility that can happen is that if there is an edge colored in blue, then, then we can already produce a, a blue H. This is the subgraph H. If this is not the case, if this is uh, uh, not colored blue while the rest are colored red, then we can already find a red F, this one, uh, the subgraph colored F, okay? This is a red F. The other possibility is when the, uh, the monochromatic K3 is red, okay? Here we have the red K3. So again, if you try to exhaust all the possibilities, okay? This will lead you to the following. So here we have a red uh, F, okay, a red F graph. Here we have a blue H, okay, this is H, it's colored in blue. And then here we have another uh, red F, okay. So in any coloring, in fact, these are the things that can happen where you can find either a red H or a blue H, okay. So there, um, the Ramsey number of FH, where F and H are the graphs shown a while ago, it's in fact seven. So seven is the smallest complete graph that you can, where you can uh, find these subgraphs. Uh, some properties no, of uh, Ramsey numbers. So for all positive integers, RB, the Ramsey number of R and B, so as I've said a while back, uh, the numbers here mean the uh, subscript of our complete subgraph. 
So say, for example, when we say R of K3, K3, it's the same as saying R33. Okay. So uh, you can swap the positions of the two digits here. This is by symmetry. Okay. Because it does not matter whether uh, uh, you first color with red and then followed by blue or you first color with blue and then followed by red. It's the same. The result will be the same. So that's symmetry. So here is another um, uh, property. It gives us a an upper bound okay, for the Ramsey number. So the Ramsey number of RB, it's always less than or equal to the Ramsey number of R minus 1B plus the Ramsey number of R B minus 1. So this property can be uh, proven, can be shown to be true, again, by using some concepts in graph theory. Here is another upper bound for the Ramsey number. So the Ramsey number for RB, it's always less than or equal to the combination of R plus B minus 2 taken R minus 1 at a time. Okay, so uh, this uh, uh, can be derived by mathematical induction using the other properties. So we are provided with bounds, okay, upper bounds or upper limits for the Ramsey number of two numbers. Uh, another property, so the Ramsey number of 1K is always equal to 1. Okay, take note 1 is simply K1. So it's the complete graph having one vertex, meaning there are no edges. So trivially, if there are no edges, then there is no need to color it. Okay, so since there is no need to color it, uh, one vertex is enough for us to find a monochromatic K1. Okay. Um, um, moving the complexity by one step. So the Ramsey number of 2K is always equal to K. K2 is simply a graph on two vertices connected by an edge. So as long as there is a single edge having the required given color, a monochromatic K2 will always exist. Okay, so uh, two here is just a pair of vertices that are attached by an edge. So as long as you can find an edge, okay, that is colored, then we can always find a monochromatic K2. So the only prob the problem arises only when the size of the complete graph is less than K, where each edge will be of the opposite color only. Okay, so um, again, um, you, we can use graph theory concepts to argue that uh, we cannot have K minus one here, okay? Because if it's K minus one or smaller, uh, there are problems that will arise where we cannot find a monochromatic K2. So it's always K. There are many other properties, okay? But uh, for this uh, short lecture, we cannot uh, present all of them because there are also uh, other requirements in order for us to understand how they work. So in this table, okay, this table uh, shows the known Ramsey numbers, okay, for uh, R from 1 to 10 and B from 1 to 10. So say, for example, when we say R, the Ramsey number of 2, 2, okay, the Ramsey number of 2, 2, so the answer there is 2. It's already been found. The Ramsey number of uh, 3, 4, okay, so the Ramsey number of 3, 4, so there it's 9, okay, 3, 4, it's 9. Notice that uh, there, are, there are cells here having two numbers, such as this one here. This means that the Ramsey number has not been found yet. Okay, It means that the, the number above on top is the lower bound, while the number below is the upper bound. So when we find the Ramsey number of 6, 4, for example, so it's this one, 6, 4. Okay. So the, some mathematicians have found that the lower bound is 36 and the upper bound is 41. So this means that the Ramsey number of 6, 4 is either 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, or 41. 
it's uh, quite a complex problem because uh, uh, usually uh, what the graph theorists do is that they try to generate all the possibilities of red blue colorings okay and try to find out if in all of these possibilities they can find the required complete subgraph having one color this one is also peculiar the ramsey number of n3 for example it's not known yet however they have found that it's at least 40 and it's at most 42 so it's either 40 41 or 42 however again as the number of vertices increases the number of edges will also increase so the number of possibilities where you can color it red or blue will blow up okay there are so many possibilities so it's quite difficult to find okay it's quite difficult to uh, find uh, the ramsey number okay for large vertices also ramsey numbers have have a connection with some events in history okay like he's here for example sir woodsword need with woodsword needing he is a scholar a historian so he observed 42 instances during the pre-christian england between 600 to 400 bc and he observed that Whenever a sixth lord or leader arrives in a peaceful region, war would always happen for a short period of time. So he, he tried to uh, analyze, he tried to observe, why is that? That whenever a sixth, a sixth leader comes into the scene, war would always happen. So he noted that uh, either one, three, four, or five of the leaders will form an alliance and thinking themselves quite powerful merged armies and attacked other lords or two there were three or more of them who were pairwise enemies and in that case war broke out among the factions so actually sir woods or needing also observed the problem the party problem a while back the problem of how many people at least will be gathered so that at least three are acquaintances or at least three are non-acquaintances. So it's very similar to what Sir, Sir Woods or Needing, Needing has observed okay, during his research. Okay, So this observation shows the case of R33, which is equal to six. Or in a group of six lords, there is guaranteed to be a group of three lords that were either mutual allies or mutual enemies, and thus will cause the region to erupt in war. However, of course, there is always one exception to the case where there is no war, when all the six lords are allies. So that is a connection to historical events. Uh, and on another note, there are other problems that are also related to Ramsey, to Ramsey theorem, such as this one by Van der Waerden's theorem, okay, or the... Uh, van der Waarden numbers. So for any positive integer P and S, there is a positive integer capital N, such that if the integers in one to N are colored using P colors, then there are at least six integers with an arithmetic progression, meaning the numbers in between have a common difference. So they call this as the van der Waarden number or W of P S. Okay, so to illustrate an example, if we have P equals two, meaning there are two colors, either red or blue, and S equals three, meaning we want three digits to be in an arithmetic progression, what would be W of two, three? So we are asking how many positive integers are required so that you can find uh, uh, integers that are colored in red or blue that form an arithmetic progression. So if we try eight, for example, okay? However, if you try eight and color it in this manner, for example, one is blue, two is red, three is R, and so on and so forth, we, can, we cannot find, okay, three digits in a, a color 
that have an arithmetic progression. Say, for example, the blue ones, one, four, five, eight. If you pick three numbers there, surely you cannot form an arithmetic progression. Okay. However, if you add one more digit, nine, okay. So if we add one more digit, we can observe that now there is an arithmetic progression of three digits in a color. Say, for example, here in this coloring, okay. Yeah, we added nine and colored it blue. If we look at one, five, and nine, okay, they are all colored blue. They form an arithmetic sequence. All the co all the uh, the difference between one and five is four. I'm sorry, Sir TJ, for nine is also. I'm sorry, Sir TJ, for interrupt. Five minutes more. Five minutes more. Okay, thank you, Ma'am Dewi. Okay, thank you. Actually, this is the last slide. <laughs> okay, so there. Uh, that's uh, an example of a problem that is very much related to Ramsey numbers. So, uh, in general, what is Ramsey theory all about? Okay, Ramsey theory has the theme of finding order from chaos. So, we have here the problem of how large must a structure be so that you can find a substructure having a particular order? Okay, so that is the theme of uh, Ramsey theory. Okay, so that will be my last uh, slide. Uh, maraming salamat. Terim uh, kasi. Thank you very much, everyone. Okay, thank you very much, Sir TJ. Really interesting topic. Uh, so all the participants, ladies and gentlemen, please, if you have any question, you can raise your hand or maybe you can drop your question in chat column. Please. Okay. You can raise your hand. So, Sir TJ, I think graph is one of uh, the interesting topic. And we have this topic in mathematics discrete um, course. But I hope maybe next... We will have the particular theory graph as a course, Mam Acne, maybe. <laughs> yes, right. uh, in fact, uh, usually uh, graph theory has many applications in uh, discrete mm -hmm. mathematics and in computer mm -hmm. sciences. Because uh, if you look at the structure of graphs, it's about connecting vertices or nodes. You can think of the vertices and the nodes as a network, a forming a network between uh, <laughs> equipment or computer systems. Okay, and then the edges will represent uh, some uh, affinity or relationship between the networks. So maybe um, uh, there the participants are also asking, they're just shy perhaps, to ask if there are any applications of uh, Ramsey theory, okay? Because in my presentation, uh, Ramsey theory seems to be just a play with numbers, okay? However, uh, Ramsey theory has its applications in uh, particularly in, in networks, as I've said a while back, no? so networks. In networks, um, you what, what would be the design, for example, of a network Okay, where, where um, it is, how do you design a network of uh, equipment, for example, so that whenever power outages or, or uh, uh, what do you call this, or um, disturbances will happen between the connections in networks, how would you design it so that the entire network will not fail? Okay, how would you design it so that there is a group of computers 
that will still work. Okay, so that is where Ramsey uh, theory can be applied. Okay, uh, another application perhaps is when we we want to sort. Okay, we want to sort uh, data. You're given a large amount of uh, data, and then somebody asks you, "Where can in which subfolder can I find this uh, this file?" For example. However, if you arrange your data in a manner so that um, there are subgroups that are orderly, then it will be easier to find such a file. Okay, so th those are some examples where uh, Ramsey theory can be applied. Yeah. All right. Uh, so now we have uh, a participant that will ask a question. Here we have Fidela. Fidela, please uh, unmute your speaker and you can uh, ask your question to Sir TJ, please. Okay, thank you, Mom. Uh, for... Mr. TJ, I want to ask you, I am a student in math education. Because math is great where the graph theory is taught. I am interested about the graph coloring, then just realized the implementation of this. But I'm still wondering to know how this theory could be implemented in the map coloring. Thank you. Um, how can we implement a Ramsey theory in coloring? Uh, actually, uh, Ramsey theory is very much related to coloring. Uh, as I said a while back, Ramsey theory is a subtopic under graph coloring. But the main difference is that when we say graph coloring, okay, we color the, either the vertices or the edges in such a way that when they are adjacent, meaning they have a common edge or a common vertex, they have different colors. For Ramsey theory, we do not need that requirement. So you can color any you using uh you can color the edges using either blue or red. Okay, you can just uh use your own coloring. But the, the key there is that. Whenever you color using the red or the blue colors, you can always find the complete subgraph that has uh, the same color for the edges. So as we have said no, in my parting, my last uh, note, uh, Ramsey theory is like finding order from chaos. So what, how, how can you color the, the graph so that you can find a substructure that is orderly, or in other words, colored using the same color. So I, I hope I answered your, your question, Miss Fidela. Okay, thank you for your answer, Mr. TJ. Okay, thank you so much, Sir TJ. I think, what about, uh, the other participants, maybe still any questions? Or it's enough? If it's enough, maybe we can uh, straight to season next season with Mr. Jericho and for Mr. TJ. For Sir TJ, thank you so much uh, for your presence here. That's really interesting presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I hope we can meet again in next program. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much. Sir thank TJ. you, Sir TJ. So maybe we straight to next season, like next session with uh, Mr. Jericho. Hello, Mr. Jericho. Hello, hello, Miss Dewey. Good morning. Hi. 
What about your connection? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm having a good connection at the moment, but okay. uh, please bear with the connection that okay. I am having. <laughs> All right. Thank God. All right, uh, Mr. Jericho. Uh, Mr. Jericho, time is yours, please. Yes. <laughs> Hello, everyone. So we are now down to the next session for this uh, international learning lectures. The International Lecture Series in Mathematics and Mathematics Education. So a while ago, with Sir TJ's talk, uh, you were uh, the theory on Ramsey's theory were discussed and all other concepts. So uh, you were filled with the uh, different concepts and uh, ideas on Ramsey's theories. But this time, for the next topic, for the next session. Well, basically, this is the session six of the International Lecture Series in Mathematics and in Mathematics Education. So this will be the se session six. So before we start, I would I am honored and grateful to introduce to you myself. I am Jericho J. Abaco from the Don Mariano Marcos Memorial State University, South London Campus, Philippines. And I will be moderating for this session. So again, good morning, everyone. And uh, I hope that you are still eager to hear the concepts and hear the discussion from our next learning resource provider. So as I introduce her, ladies and gentlemen, the learning resource provider for this session is an assistant professor in the University PGRI of the Semarang, Indonesia, under the Department of Mathematics and is the cur current coordinator of the International Office, Faculty of Education, Mathematics, Sciences, and Technology Information. So she also, she graduated with a bachelor's degree in mathematics education. Her expertise for this talk at State University of Semarang, Indonesia, with master's degree in mathematics education as well in the State University of Surabaya, Indonesia, and Curtin University, Western Australia. She also had her pre-doctoral in mathematics education in the University of Auckland, New Zealand, with her research interests in mathematics connection, mathematical literacy, digital technology for education, and STEM, teaching and learning mathematics, STEAM education, and edupreneurship, she had and continuing to have a rich research background. To name a few of her professional distinctions and membership, she is a reviewer in the Springer Nature Journal Humanities and Social Sciences Communications, awardee of Kemendikbud Indonesia Cyber Education Institute of Professional Course on CS50's Introduction to Programming with Python in the, universe, in the Harvard University. And she is also an awardee of Kemendikbud Indonesia Cyber Education Institute Professional Course Constructivism Mathematics, Science, Technology, Education in the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. So her recent research publications and dissemination in peer-reviewed journal and this year in TEM journal is entitled Virtual Lab Geometry Development as Online Learning Media Alternatives at Universitas PGRI Semarang and in Universities Technology Malaysia. He is also referee, she also refereed conferences, proceedings in 2019 until 2022 and was able to peer-reviewed books, chapters starting 2014 until today with a total number of 34 peer-reviewed journal articles, 14 books, book chapters, and 6 conference proceedings and 10 intellectual property rights patented. Ladies and gentlemen, our resource speaker, who will be talking about group theory, uh, a virtual round of applause to Dr. Agnita Siska from Sari. Good morning, Dr. Agnita. Good morning, Mr. Jerry Joe. Thank you very much for letting me in this session. Uh, okay. I would like to share my material. Is that already clear enough? 
Yes, ma'am. We are, yes, ma'am. We are seeing your presentation. But let All me right. just ask if you could present it. I mean, uh -huh. um, slideshow pre in a slideshow presentation. Yes, I has already done with uh, the slideshow. How because, is it now? Because we are still hell, it we are still, still seeing the other slides, ma'am. All right, but uh, I have already slided so. Oh, okay. I will. I will try it again. How about now? Has been changed. Has it been changed, or still in the uh, format presentation? Can I solicit the information of other participants? Are you still seeing the other slides of Doctor Agnita? Or I have already seen the the cover. The front cover. How about the other? How about the other participants? Can I request? Are you still seeing the other slides of Dr. Agnesa, Agnita's talk? Because on my screen, oh, okay. because on my still, screen, still the same. Yeah. All right. Because on my I will screen, ask the, the, what's the, one of the students here, Miss Videla. Are you there? Uh, could you see my screen has already slideshow? Oh, but I have already make it slideshow. Uh, All right. I think you could uh try it again, ma'am. You start. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. Stop presenting. Right, I will stop then, it for and then present it again. Okay. Okay, how about now? Ah, still the same. Still the same one. Can we seek a technical help from the host of this session, the Laboratorium Mat of Greece, mm -hmm. to, to help Dr. Agnita in her presentation? How about now? Ah, still the same. Buffy Dela? Can you come here, please? Okay. Yeah. Can you help me? So when I have already taught this, but then the participants still see that this is in the presentation uh, appearance. Can you check it, please? all right but uh, i don't think that it will be a big deal can i start now mr yeah, yeah. jericho yes yeah, sure, no, sure no. <laughs> yes because actually i have already a slideshow in my uh, screen but then uh, i also seen that in the in the presentation it is still seen that uh, in the presentation uh, appearance so let me just start it now uh, now this is uh, my honor to share the topic that i uh, that become one of my research interests and also uh, one of the uh, courses that i taught this semester so we will talk about the uh, exploring STEM through project-based learning. Discrete mathematics goes hands-on. Uh, so I would like to greet all the participants, my dear student from Universitas PKI Semarang, and my lovely student from Dimsu. Uh, hope, hopefully you are doing well. Uh, everyone, you can just approach me to this kind of uh, professional link and research uh, identity. And then you can also contact me through my 
uh, working email and WhatsApp if you have any concern about the same topic for further collaboration. So this is the outline uh, for my speak today. First of all, <clears throat> I would like to talk about introduction to STEM project-based learning. And then uh, we will know about what is the benefit by implementing the STEM project-based learning into the classroom teaching and learning. And then the third one is designing effective STEM projects in discrete mathematics. And we will continue by how to develop and then strategy to develop the assessing student learning in STEM project-based learning. And at last, uh, come to the conclusion we will uh, we would like to know how was the how is the future of STEM project based learning in discrete mathematics? How is the probability on it? So first of all, uh, we would like to know about what does it STEM PGPL itself. So when uh, we are heading to the twenty first learning century competency, so the student. Uh, need to have that competence to heading that era. One of uh, the competencies is how the student <clears throat> could think critically and how to think <clears throat> creatively. And then we know that a kind of approach that is STEM uh, <clears throat> stands for Dr. science. Dr. Agnita, sorry, yes. sorry to disturb you, but yes. I think your slides are not moving mm -hmm. on my... There you go. Mm. Uh, still in this, on on what slide? Uh, still on the introduction to STEM project-based learning. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. Okay. We are still in the slide of <clears throat> introduction to STEM project-based learning. So uh, STEM project-based learning is uh, <clears throat> stand for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And then <clears throat> this kind of approach could enhance uh, particular skills that is um, needed by the 21st learner. That is the critical thinking. Uh, analysis thinking, creativity, problem solving, and the students should have the communication skill when they have to work in the teamwork. <clears throat> so what does it actually? This approach is designed to, to teach students how to apply scientific principles and theories to the real world situation, <clears throat> which will help them develop the skills and knowledge necessary to succeed in the STEM related field. <clears throat> I'm sorry, it's a Jericho. <clears throat> All right. So uh, what does the purpose of implementing the STEM PGBL is it? Because the uh, STEM PGBL has uh, an opportunity for the teacher or for the lecturer to provide the student with the <clears throat> improving of such kind of uh, 21st learner uh, century skills. So uh, this kind of approach could help the student to provide them the experiential learning that will be encourage them to work collaboratively and then think creatively to solve the problem related to their daily life. And then they, they have the knowledge to be implemented to solve the complex problem. <clears throat> then by working on real world project, that are relevant to their life, students can develop a deeper understanding of scientific principles and theories, then gain practical skills that they can use in their future careers. Uh, uh, Mr. Jericho, <clears throat> does my slide has already changed? Yes, ma'am, the slide is now on the engineering, engineering. process. 
All right, yeah. thank you. So we are moving to the engineering design process. E here on STEM uh, stand for engineering. STEM without E would not create the STEM lesson since engineering is the heart of STEM lesson. So we could not uh, derive a STEM lesson without the, the existence of the uh, engineering. So as a mathemat as, as a mathematics uh, educator, when we we are uh, willing to develop the STEM lesson, at least we have to integrate it, two aspects in STEM. That is mathematics and engineering. <clears throat> Uh, so what about the engineering design process itself? So this is a series of steps that engineers use to solve the problem and create innovative solution to complex challenges. Integrating into STEM project-based learning can help students develop critical thinking, problem solving, and collaboration while engaging them in hands-on or experiential learning. <laughs> so during uh, working on the project, the project itself is kind of the social life that have to be solved by the student in a group. So they have to talk about uh, how to solve that problem, but then uh, it will be uh, firstly define the problem itself so they can uh, determine how the way to solve that problem. By having this kind of engineering design process and engaging them in the STEM PGPL, this is uh, the essential part for success in STEM-related fields, such as in the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields. <clears throat> so the process helps students to understand the importance of research experimentation and then testing encourages them to take a creative and collaborative approach to problem solving. <laughs> this is the diagram of the engineering design process. So first, first of all, when the students are heading to the problem, firstly, they have to define what is the problem should be uh, solved. And then after that, after the group of students in the work, uh, in the teamwork has already know about the problem itself. So it will become easily for them in the group to talk about how to uh, solve the problem. They could uh, brainstorm the idea. Uh, we, we realized that when, when the student working in the work, uh, work group, they, might, uh, they may have uh, many ideas. But then after that, they have to select select the, the more suitable uh, opportunity to solve the problem. After that, after they are choosing the best solution, they have to develop a detailed plan and create a, create a prototype or model. Uh, after that, we, we could not, uh, define whether this prototype is good or uh, well developed enough, but then we we need to test and evaluate. So uh, the process will be followed by the testing the prototype or model, and then we will know the effectiveness. After we testing the the prototype, we will use the feedback uh, to refine and improve the quality, the solution that have been chosen before. And finally, come to the communication uh, session. The team, the student in each team have opportunity to communicate to, uh, to communicate and present their result to other group. So this is the engineering design process step that should be uh, followed by the student while they are doing their project. This is the framework STEM PGPL Laboy and RAS. This is one of the framework that I use in my research. So there are consists of five stages. The first one is reflection. Um, this is the first stage uh, where bringing the student into the context of the problem. So uh, it is important to provide the students with the real life problem. So this is the framework that we use 
when we are implementing into the uh, teaching and learning uh, classroom in the classroom. <clears throat> Because in the reflection here, uh, we, we would like to provide an inspiration to students to start investigating. So this is uh, the role of the problem hold an important uh, position here. And after the students have the uh, real life problem, uh, they have to uh, do some research. So as a facilitator in the classroom, I mean, as a teacher or a lecturer, uh, we need to facilitate our student to take them form of research. Uh, this is, can be a small research like uh, the student could examine scientific concepts and then select readings or gather information from relevant sources. They can use also the internet sources for uh, make sure the kind of uh, related re references. After that, uh, the next step, student begin to discover learning processes. They have to determine what is still unknown and find project steps as problem solving. So here, they have opportunity to discover how to solve the problem itself. And the, the following uh, procedure is application. So students here uh, start to modeling a problem solving. They, they try to test the design model that have already discovered before. And then based on the results, students can repeat the previous step. So this is not only the, the what's that, the straight away process, but they can like make a backward procedure <clears throat> at last. Uh, the student present their models and solution for this step to develop communication and collaboration skills. That's why uh, this method is pretty helpful to enhance the 21st uh, century competency learning. Uh, we are continuing with the framework STEM integrated. So what does it mean? Uh, STEM integrated is an approach to education that combines the subject matter of two or more STEM subjects into a joint learning experience. As I stated before, uh, such as I am a, a mathematics educator, when uh, I'm going to implement the STEM, uh, into my classroom teaching. So I have to choose at least one is mathematics itself, and then I will choose another is engineering. But is okay? Is it okay if I would like to gather all the subject related? Integrated STEM education aims to provide students with a deeper understanding of the connection between the different STEM subject and how they can be applied to real world problems. So uh, this is important to have the real problem because it will be helpful for the students to know more about the problem that is related to their life. <clears throat> integrated STEM, anyway, uh, integrated STEM education can take many forms, including project-based learning, uh, design-based learning and other disciplinary approach. So in this case, uh, I integrated with the project-based learning. In some uh, cases, I also integrated with geometry and the use of mathematics uh, program or software. Um, all in all, the goal is to provide the student with more holistic and comprehensive understanding of STEM subjects and how they can be applied in the real world. <clears throat> when uh, we are asking about how the STEM PGPL could be implemented, so uh, based on the references, educational setting for STEM PGPL could be implemented in a variety of educational setting from elementary school to university, even from the uh, early childhood education. We have already known that there are many publications that talk about the implement implementation STEM in the early childhood education as well. And it can be tailored to meet the specific needs and interests of uh, different groups of students. It is an effective 
a teaching method for students of all ages and backgrounds. And it can help to bridge the achievement gap by providing equal opportunities for learning and growth. So uh, it has been seen that the benefit of the STEM PGPL itself could, could be implemented for all ages. <clears throat> so uh, besides, it could be uh, implemented for all uh, variety educational setting. It is also stated that STEM project-based learning could develop the deep understanding because uh, it is applying to the real world problem. And it is also um, develop this, the essential skills for success in the rapidly changing world in the 21st century. So then um, our question will uh, come to the, how to design an effective STEM project in this skirt mathematics. So in the previous session, uh, Sir DJ has already talked about the graph theory the, uh, where it is part of the discrete mathematics for uh, curriculum in mathematical education in Universitas PGRI Semarang. So this is a great opportunity to make a connection how the advanced mathematics knowledge uh, that is mathematic, discrete mathematics where it consists of combinatoric and then recursion, graph theory, Tixtra algorithm, and many more could be implemented in the real life situation. <clears throat> so in the context of discrete mathematics, STEM project-based learning can be used to engage students in exploring mathematical concepts through hands-on projects. We have known that uh, there are many uh, game, theory, uh, game and application that has been uh, used the implemented the implementation theory from the discrete mathematics. All right, and then <clears throat> how to develop it, uh, develop it such that we 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 will have the effective. Uh, STEM project in discrete mathematics. So first of all, everyone or maybe students who just work on STEM PGPL, uh, maybe you have a question about how to develop the project itself. First of all, the, the one thing that need to be uh, carefully attention is when we are start to plan the project itself, First, we have to know about the learning goals and objectives. Objective. Why? Because we will work it on the classroom uh, teaching, right? So it is important for us to create the subject such that uh, it is aligned with the curriculum and then it also provides the opportunity for the student to apply mathematical concept in a meaningful way. So um, the student not only learn about the theory itself, but that they have an opportunity to implementing the theory to solve the problem. And, and, and STEM uh, give this bridge to, uh, to connect this. Uh, moreover, the project should be also designed to promote collaboration and communication among students. That's why um, it also involves uh, several students in a group to collaborate because they have to uh, share their idea when they are starting to solve the problem. When we also realize that each student may have the different idea or argumentation on it, but then they have to learn about how to communicate, how to negotiate, to choose whether this is a good a solution or not. So uh, the communication will be happen among the students. Beside that, uh, the project should provide an opportunity for students to reflect on their learning and receive feedback from their peers and teacher. How it will be uh, given 
So when the students try to present their work, they could uh, get the feedback from the other group. It means that uh, the student from another group will provide them with the constructive feedback as well as from the teacher. But then uh, the group also do the self-evaluation based on the uh, another performance for another group. They could reflect on, oh, okay, I noticed that I should improve this part because uh, I know when another group just, um, what's that? Uh, running their project, we could see that there is some challenging here or concern, anything that should be handling. Uh, we come to the discrete mathematics goes hands on. So what is it? What can be a sort of, of discrete mathematics goes hands on? So we will uh, define, uh, no, I mean like recall again, what does actually discrete mathematics is talking about. So this is a branch of mathematics that deals with discrete object and structures such as graphs, networks, and combinatorial objects. Traditionally, it has been taught through abstract concept and theoretical proofs. So then how we could make it uh, concrete or close to the real world problem? Nah. However, there is a growing trend toward incorporating hands-on activities. So by using this kind of hands-on activities and project-based learning, we could make this kind of uh, advanced mathematical knowledge, discrete mathematics here, become accessible for students, particularly for students in the uh, school. I mean, in the junior high school or in the senior high school in Indonesia, we, we have to do differentiated uh, junior high school and senior high school. Okay, uh, on the right side in our slide, this is the Sudoku. The Sudoku. This is one way to bring hands-on activities into discrete mathematics through the use of games and puzzles. We know this is Sudoku, and then we have to put uh, number one until nine into square and with particular uh, requirement. That is, there is no same uh, number on its column in its uh, row. And then we also know about this, this on the right is the can can puzzle. So, um, um, the existence of technology also uh, provide us an opportunity to enjoy the game that is means ah oh, this is will will shifting the hands on activity to the technology can use okay all right but then we also can use uh, the application here uh, by doing the the trade in the traditional way by uh, incorporating the hands on activity and the on the left side, we know the Tower Hanoi. This is also the application, uh, the implementation of the recursion, relation recursive. Okay, this is also one of the most uh, famous problems. That is the seven bridges of Konigsberg, where uh, the people should uh, uh, across the bridge only once. And then they have to cross all the bridges. All right. Um, Project-based learning is another way to make discrete mathematics more hands-on. Students can work on real-world projects such as network design, cryptography, and data analysis, which require them to apply concepts and techniques learned in class to solve pro practical problems. So here, for my beloved student in the mathematics, mathematics discrete course, uh, they have uh, to develop a project uh, based on the topic in the graph theory or any other topic, they can have, they can choose the particular topic they have already learned and then start to develop the project based STEM. Uh, 
Incorporating hands-on activities in discrete mathematics not only makes the subject more engaging and fun for students, but also helps to develop skills such as critical thinking. Why is it developed? Because when they are heading to the new problem, they have to think about how to solve it. That's why the, 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 following, the following skills is problem solving. And then since they are working in the group, so they have to collaborate with their friend. It is also provide more concrete understanding of abstract concept and then making them easier to grasp and apply in the real world situation. Sometimes uh, it is easy for us to learn such uh, an abstract concept by learning through a games maybe. And then like when we know about the uh, Tower Hano, we, will, we, we may think about, oh, is it easier than we, we learn about the recursion itself, but then, that that one is part of the uh, the use of such kind of concept, abstract concept. So um, there are two, at least two uh, cases that student may can develop on their project in mathematics discrete. The first one is problem about how to minimize the cost of data transmission. Another project has been uh, explained from my uh, student in the discrete mathematics courses that I taught. One of them tried to develop a project how to uh, determine the shortest path when the people are doing travel from one place to another place. Um, by the way, uh, this kind of problem could be solved by uh, can be uh, can be solved by uh, using the Chikstra algorithm. However, I'm trying to um, what's that to support uh, to uh, motivate them to think about how if there are another external factors that influence how the people will choose the 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 best path to achieve the place. So it doesn't matter about the, the shortest time or the shortest distance, but we also talk about the, the effective or efficient ways to come up here. But then when we um, try to implementing the minimizing the cost of data transmission, we could ask our students to work on hands-on activity using physical model by using the network topology. So uh, as a teacher, we can prepare the material such as paper, string, and tab. And then maybe the question will come up is how to develop such kind of problems so that the student will experience the engineering design process. And we could call it as the STEM. Um, by the way, uh, we have to incorporate the engineering design process. So we have to develop the problem by providing them the opportunity how to define the problem. So start the problem from the real world situation. Next, the second one is scheduling problem. So this is kind of uh, real life that close to us. Maybe the teacher should um, create the schedule program for doing the, for starting the semester, or maybe for conducting the midterm examination or the final examination, we have, they have to scheduling the timeline, and then they they have to consider about the uh, how long the, the examination will be held, how many students will be involved, and then how many subjects or courses should be tested. So it becomes several uh, consideration when the teacher or the lecturer trying to make a schedule for administration in the uh, school or in the university. 
So actually, this is involve applying the combinatory concepts such as permutation and combination to the real world problem. Uh, here, the student could work physical model of the scheduling problem using material materials such as whiteboards, markers, and sticky notes. So this is the task for the students or the lecturer to design whether during the uh, uh, process of uh, solving the project, doing the project, uh, to make sure whether their students should uh, experience the engineering design process itself. Then, how to make a successful project? First, to create a successful project in discrete mathematics, there are several steps that can be followed. First of all, as, as I stated before, it is important to identify a real world problem that can be solved using discrete mathematics concepts such as script theory or combinatorics. So let's let's say we, we will take a graph theory. So the first one is we have to define the scope of the project and set clearly the goals and objectives. Next, after we have already set a solid purpose or the learning goals, we will plan for the project, including the timeline, the resources needed, and the roles and responsibilities of team member. So it is important for the team member while they are working in the work, in the work group, um, they have to consider about the responsibility of them. Then uh, the next process, uh, the next tips is conduct research to gather data and information relevant to the problem. It is also uh, implemented for everything. Research is important. So uh, by doing kind of research, it will provide us an information whether, okay, this is good, this is suitable, this is acceptable, acceptable this is achievable or not. And then apply discrete mathematics concept to analyze the data and develop insight and conclusions. After that, develop a prototype or model of the solution using hands-on activities and materials. So by having the hands-on activity, it would uh, in, involve the students to, what's that? They will know about how to mathematizing the, the abstract concept into the concrete, concrete things in the real world. And then after that, we have to test and evaluate and present the project to finding to an audience such as their classmates, teachers, or community members. So this is kind of the engineering uh, design process anyway. Overall, a successful project in discrete mathematics should be based on a real world. This is the key. Incorporate hands-on activities and materials and apply discrete mathematics concepts to develop a solution. It should be also well-planned, well-executed, and effectively communicated to an audience. Then after we have already finished with a project from the student or student, then this is the time for the teacher or the lecturer to assess that uh, project itself. So how to assess the student learning in STEM project based learning? All right, so we have at least two things that should be evaluated. The first one is process, and the second one is product of the project itself. So uh, when we talk about the process evaluation, we will focusing on the student collaboration, uh, their communication, how the way to solve the problem. And then uh, all of them has already uh, proven when they, when they are work, all right? So we can use the observation sheet. Well, the product itself, um, we can assess the quality of the final product and how well it is meets the learning objective. So the assessment should be ongoing throughout the project. It cannot be only the end of the project, but we, we will see the process, all right? Um, with opportunity for students to receive feedback. Yes, of course, because uh, they, they could make some refinement after uh, get 
the constructive feedback from the classmate or from the teacher. So they have the opportunity to make a revision and improve the quality of their work. And then uh, uh, the assessment type that can be used is rubrics. It is to provide clear expectation and criteria for assessment. And self-assessment come from the student itself, peer assessment from the group of students. And can also be incorporated to promote student ownership of their learning. So when we are incorporate the students in the uh, hands-on or experiential learning, the student may have like uh, their confidence will be improved because they they may feel that, okay, I have this uh, learning path and experience. So it will be, uh, more meaningful for them. So in STEM PGPL, students work collaboratively on projects that require them to integrate knowledge and skills from different disciplines, such as science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. However, while we are assessing, it will be challenging uh, as traditional assessment because we can just... Uh, Let's say that we, we would like to assess the mathematical competence. So we can just capture the learning objective in the, in the mathematics that we would like to achieve. However, when we would like to assess this kind of uh, skills, so we need a, a multi-dimensional nature uh, to capture all the aspects that is integrated in the STEM PJPL itself. So there are several strategies for assessing students' learning in STEM PJPL. The first one is rubrics. By using the rubrics, we could assess the student um, by determining the, the criteria, such as the content knowledge, the critical thinking, the problem solving, the creativity, and communication. Uh, this rubric also provide clear expectation so everyone could help to do assessment because uh, this rubric should be clear enough so they have to uh, make it as clear as possible all right and the next one is peer and self-assessment incorporate peer and self-assessment into the assessment process this is not only help students develop metacognitive skills but also allows for more varied perspective on students learning who knows when the student try to uh, derive a self-assessment there will be more um uh, what's that they could write about themselves fluently. They, uh, we will allow them to freely writing about themselves, about their progress, uh, about their growing, something like that. And the next one is authentic assessment. We use authentic assessment that mirror real world context and tasks. This can include tasks such as designing and building prototypes, conducting experiments and creating multimedia presentation. So it, it uh, when we have the product, it become a, an authentic assessment, not only provide more accurate measure of students learning, but also in the student engagement and motivation. And then formative assessment. Uh, we are using formative assessment throughout the project to monitor students' progress and provide them with the feedback. This can also include techniques such as observation, questioning, and informal assessment. Uh, formative assessment itself could help to identify uh, where the students may be struggling and allows for timely intervention or support. So uh, this kind of a method also uh, allow the student to take some break because sometimes when the student having a difficulty, uh, the, the teacher should realize whether, okay, one of the students should need a rescue, need a help, something like that. And the last one is reflection. Incorporate reflection into the assessment process to help students develop metacognitive skills and think critically about their learning. So when, when we are trying to reflect 
on our own learning, we will know about such as, oh, okay, I understand about it and I still don't understand about this and this is still unknown. I'm going to know about something that I have been uh, already know and didn't understand. Okay, this is uh, this can include activities such as journaling, class discussion, and peer feedback. Sometimes uh, students will be more comfortable when they are uh, discussing discuss with their peers instead of with a teacher or with their lecture. Reflection allows students to articulate their learning and provides insight into their thought process and problem solving strategies. All right, come to the end of the session. This is the graph theory, finding the shortest, shortest path. Okay, it can be solved by using Tixtra algorithm. As I stated before, one of uh, my student, I mean, one of the group in my classroom in the discrete mathematics, they just developed um, the problem, how to find the shortest path to go to campus of Greece from their uh, boarding house. So they have several possibility to choose. And then uh, I provide the feedback for them to, to think about the, what's that, the external factors that may influence the way to, to determine the shorter, shortest path. I mean, this is, uh, related to the time achievement from campus to uh, uh, the, the, their boarding house as well. Next one is the map coloring. This is as also has already um, talked about in the previous session with CERTJ on RMC theory, but then uh, we, we integrated it in the STEM PGPL on the hands-on activity in discrete mathematics. So um, when when students working on a graph coloring, it will require them to analyze problem because this is the implementation of graph coloring, develop the solution and evaluate their effectiveness. This process helps to build a problem solving skills. This is uh, important for both teaching and learning mathematics. And then uh, why the creativity is developed here? Because in coloring the graph in this project will encourage students to think creatively by exploring different approaches to problem solving and developing new ideas. It happens because uh, some of students in a group, they may think about in different starting point. So when they are trying to coloring the, the map, uh, they have to um, make sure where is the starting point is it? And then they have to consider where, when two area are adjacent, they should have the different color. This is the application of the graph theory. And the collaboration itself, the student work in team to solve a problem or complete a challenge. Collaboration help to foster critical thinking as well by encouraging students to exchange idea, evaluate each other's work and develop collective solution. All right, there are another two uh, skills that has already um, obtained when, when, when we are implementing this into uh, mathematics subject or mathematics courses. This is the application of knowledge. So a graph color project can help pre-service teachers to apply their mathematical knowledge to real world problem, which can enhance their understanding of the subject. And then it has also helped them to develop more practical and applicable approach to teaching mathematics and their reflection. They can reflect on their learning and problem solving process. This reflection can help to build critical thinking skills by encouraging students to evaluate their own work, identify areas of improvement and develop strategies for future learning and teaching. And we come to the conclusion, uh, we, we think about 
how will be the future of STEM PGPL in discrete mathematics? So um, this is the STEM PGPL has, uh, we can see that it has a potential to revolutionize the way we teach and learn mathematics. So how the advanced uh, mathematics learning will be accessible for uh, students from, from the uh, not higher education uh, level, I mean from maybe for the elementary student or the secondary student, secondary school student. And the second one is by integrating real world project with mathematical concept, we can engage students in meaningful and relevant learning experiences that promote critical thinking, problem solving, collaboration. This is uh, we now as 21st uh, le century learning competence. As we move toward a more technology driven and interconnected world, the need for STEM skills will only continue to grow. So this is kind of opportunity for doing a research or a STEM lesson or anything about STEM. And then STEM project-based learning can help prepare students for the challenges and opportunities for the future and equip them with the skills and knowledge they need to success. All right, this is the end of presentation. Thank you for your attention. And then I give it back the time to Mr. Jericho. Thank you very much. All right, thank you to Dr. Agnita for sharing us her expertise in STEM education, the PJBL in discrete mathematics. So my take on the talk of our uh, credible resource provider, resource speaker for this session is we cannot uh, call it STEM without engineering, as she right. said. <laughs> we cannot because have Because E STEM. is the heart. E is All the right. heart of STEM. <laughs> and this project in like discrete mathematics could promote and somehow promotes uh, collaboration, communication, and can still provide opportunities for the students and even for the lecturers to reflect on collaborative learning. Greatly noted, Mr. Jericho. All right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> so this time, uh, I will be opening the virtual floor for any questions, mm -hmm. clarifications for uh, everyone you can now uh, uh, raise, raise a hand, uh, unmute yourself, or even you could type your question in our chat box. Anyone from the uh, participants from Indonesia? Any question to Dr. Agnita for her fruitful talk? Uh, she discussed it very well. <laughs> or any part uh, aside from... We have a message here from Dr. Estrada. So from a student, mm -hmm. aside from discrete mathematics, what other math subject is STEM PJBL applicable, Dr. Agnita? Okay. All right. Sorry, can you repeat the question again? Uh, again, I repeat. Uh, the question is, aside from discrete mathematics, what other math subjects All is right. STEM PJBL applicable? All right, so we can uh, uh, implement to another courses such as uh, the thing that we have already done in arithmetic, uh, but actually this is uh, implementing for junior high school. But then for another subject that we have already implementing is also in the number pattern. So uh, we implementing the project-based learning by uh, develop a uh, subject that is related to the uh, local wisdom in Semarang because uh, on some rural area here have a flood that regularly happen and then we are asked the student to think about how to solve the problem so that the the society around the area could um, what's that um, evacuate when the flood is happened. So they, they, they will ask to develop some project by using the theory of number pattern to develop uh, everything that there are exists around them to build some, such kind of building to, uh, to make a constraint such that the water cannot flow 
uh, easily and then destroy destroy the uh, the house of the uh, society of the people around them. So this is one of the real project that we have already uh, implementing another way. Uh, when we are trying to implementing with another subject, such as when we are uh, heading to the uh, mitigation for the, what's that? Uh, mitigation for the um, earthquake, maybe. So we could just... Uh, attempt make a, an attempt by integrating the science aspect and the mathematics itself to help the people where they are living in the mountain to effect with them in the in the uh, close to the land area we need to think about what kind of the parachute that can be developed with the different kind of geometry shapes so we will uh, think about the more efficient that will gather them from the top mountain to the land because when the earthquake happened, so we have to think quickly, something like that. So uh, there are many possibilities to be implementing through STEM project based learning. Okay. Hopefully it can answer the question from the student in Dimsul. All right, from uh, uh, Dr. PJ Strada. Uh, thank you very much, Ma Magnit. You are welcome, Sir PJ, and my lovely student in Dimsu. Uh, I think we could entertain more. Uh, next question. We could entertain another question. Anyone? <laughs> any question from, from students in Indonesia? Or students from Philippines? Do we still have questions, clarifications to so Dr. Agnita? Any question? Okay, right. I think uh, our participants, Dr. Agnita, are well learned and they they pick up a lot of learnings from your talk because you you discuss Hopefully. it very well with with the practical applications of the theories and concepts. So. Uh, it is very fruitful discussion from the end of the participants. Hopefully. Okay, thank you very much, so, Sir Jericho. Hopefully it will be fruitful for all of us. If there being none, no questions from both ends <laughs> of the participants. <laughs> right. Again, uh, a virtual round of applause to our learning resource provider for this session. Talking about thank the you. group theory. Okay, so as part of the drill, May I request any everyone to please uh, open your cameras for the documentation uh -huh. for this session. Okay, can I request to open the cameras of every participants, our participants from Indonesia as well as the participants from here in the Philippines to be part of the documentation. I will just have the virtual picture. I'll just screen capture my screen for the documentation for Today's uh, two sessions, a session from Dr. Strada and uh, the session from Dr. Agnita. So again, uh, may I request every participant to open their cameras, please? Please open your camera, Putri, Aris, Ega, Pratiwi, everyone that is still already here. Please open your camera, please. All right. All right. Okay, uh, some of the participants are not yet uh, open their camera. So please, can I request? Okay, so we have two frames here. So just uh, stay put and smile on your cameras. I'll just uh, make sure that everyone is part of the frame. So okay, ready, smile, everyone. For the first frame, they're ready. One, two, three. Okay, another frame. Ready. One, two. All right. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for everyone. Uh, I hope that you responded to the link for the attendance for these two sessions. 
because this is very important. Your attendance is very important for you to to claim your certificates for the international lecture series. All right, okay? for claim the certificate. <laughs> yes. So I think we could call it a day. Thank you for participating, our participants from Indonesia and the participants from the Philippines. So ladies and gentlemen, this is this has been the session five and session six for the international lecture series on mathematics and mathematics education. As we bring you to uh, the succeeding session for the succeeding topics. So we hope to see you again for the succeeding sessions and topics on the scheduled dates. And thank you for your participation. Again, thank you to Dr. Estrada and thank you to Dr. Agnita for this two sessions. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Jericho. So TJ, see you again for another you, Agnita, collaboration. Dr. Jericho. <laughs> and also to Mam Dewi, thank you for moderating the first session. And Mam Dewi. Yes, yes, already uh, pick up her children. <laughs> All right. I will convey Again, it to Mrs. Dewi. Yes, Dr. Nye. Again, to our participants, please see to it that you responded to the attendance form mm -hmm. sent here at our uh, chat group. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a great lunch. Thank you. Bye.